Hello and welcome to the opening session of the second Future of the American Child Journalism Training at the National Press Foundation. We are thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to have you here for a few days of intensive, thoughtful conversations about the future of the American child. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the Heising Simons Foundation. So, a few months ago, back in January of this year, the American Academy of Pediatrics announced a new set of guidelines about treating childhood obesity. This comes after decades, really, of conversations about child health, uh, why children are obese, uh, what can we do about it, uh, topics like food deserts and access to quality food and whether or not children get enough exercise are all a part of the discussion. But I believe we're at sort of a tipping point in history in terms of making the connection and acknowledging the connection between socioeconomics and obesity and who can afford to eat well, who can afford to play safely, and how we move forward in dealing with obesity. So for this training, we are absolutely uh, honored to have one of the country's leading experts on child health and child obesity to join us today. Dr. Roy Kim is the head of pediatric endocrinology with the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for being here today. It's a real pleasure, Rachel. Thanks for inviting me, and it's uh, welcome to Cleveland, everybody. Um, I hope the weather's good for you. Had you come last week, you would have enjoyed some snow, so I'm, I'm <laughs> glad it was uh, this week and not last. Well, you know, I think at this point, um, you can go to our website at nationalpress.org to read his full bio. But for now, as we're getting to know you, why don't you give us some background on your career and how you got into the lane of pediatric endocrinology? Sure. I uh, grew up in Iowa. And um, you know, in Iowa, I, I was sort of without a whole lot of direction in my life. But uh, my father being a physician, that was the the path I followed, and it was later in my training uh, during residency, and I was a resident at the Cleveland Clinic, that I became interested in pediatric endocrinology. It was really a field where uh, one could appreciate how the developmental stage of the child really affected how disease became manifest, and things that happen in children could have a very different effect uh, than it would in adulthood. And as children grow and go through puberty, uh, d d disease speaks in different ways. Um, after residency, I began my pediatric endocrinology fellowship, and that's where I really became interested in metabolic disease, and in particular, obesity. Uh, it started actually in a lab hood, studying fat cells. Uh, but I think, uh, fortunately and positively, as my training progressed, I, I could see that well, studying fat cells is important and right for some people, but to really make a big impact on childhood health, you have to think more broadly. And thus, I became a director of a clinical program in pediatric obesity in Dallas, and then uh, continued the same role here in Cleveland. So when I saw the announcement about the uh, American Academy decision to do that, you were quoted in quite a few features talking about the issue of you know, whether a child has access to a safe place to play, proper nutrition is important. I'm wondering if you and your career just came to a place where you felt like you had to you know, call it out and to actually have people recognize that this was a real issue. Well, I think being in Cleveland really heightens one, one's awareness of this issue. Uh, Cleveland is the, the uh, has the highest proportion of children living in poverty among large cities, so cities with 300,000 people or more. And as I hope to address a little bit in a, a few brief slides, 
Um, obesity can affect every child, regardless of race or income, but it has an outsized outsize effect in uh, lower income households. And so I, I think, you know, if we think about the problem of obesity, you can study its biology and how brain signaling works and the impact of having a, a lot of um, adipose or fat tissue in the body. But to really address it at a large scale and at the level of public health, you have to think about factors such as economics, access to grocery stores, uh, safe places to play, even things like food policy and um, having PE class in school and education about a healthy diet. And before I let you go to your presentation, um, I think we've all seen headlines about Ozempic and medi medically treating obesity. And I just wonder if that's another huge turning point in when the uh, medical profession is urging treatment of children with obesity with drugs. A lot of the inquiries uh, from the press after these guidelines were announced were focused on uh, the heightened prominence in the recommendations for medications and weight loss surgery. And for a long time, and it had been 15 years since the last set of guidelines had come out, and those guidelines really focused uh, on lifestyle changes, nutrition, physical activity. And I would say the new guidelines also share that focus. But the fact uh, is that in the last 10 years, more and more effective medicines have been developed, uh, FDA approved for use in adults. And in the last two to five years, many of these are starting to come online for children uh, and particularly adolescents. So it's become a real question uh, what sort of criteria should we use to treat adolescents with medications that may be very expensive or have a, have a set of side, side effects that uh, need to be considered? Um, and also, uh, what is the role of surgery? It's been accumulating a longer track record of safe use, but it also um, has its attendant risks and expenses. And we still don't know what happens to children who use surgery uh, 20 years from now or 40 years from now, it's quite different from a person in their, say, 30s to 50s having surgery. Uh, so there are still a lot of unanswered questions about these other treatments that, that was a major focus, I think, at the press inquiries that uh, came out after the guidelines were announced. Great. Well, why don't you take it away at this point? All right. Thank you. So why uh, talk about childhood obesity? Uh, you know, there are a range of challenges face facing today's children. As a physician and in my field, obesity is of particular interest, mainly because uh, of these factors. It is becoming more and more common, and I'll show you some data about the prevalence of obesity uh, over the past few decades. It's extremely impactful, and not just in a physical or medical sense, but there's also a huge social dimension and psychosocial dimension to it, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Maybe more than any other medical condition that I treat, it is surrounded by a lot of stigma and also myths about its origins, why it develops, and how it could be treated. And today, more than in years past, I think there's a reason for optimism from the standpoint of these new developments of medications and the safe record of surgery although uh, clearly those aren't things that can be rolled out to everybody, nor would we want that. So in terms of topics to be covered, I will uh, spend a few slides talking about obesity as a medical condition, how we define it, and spend some time talking about the medical complications and things that we look for when we encounter a children who is affected by obesity. Uh, we'll also talk about stigma and the social dimension and the behavioral health and mental health dimension of the condition. Uh, I'd like to also introduce you to uh, how we regard the quality of evidence in medical science. And that's not just from research studies, but it also pertains to the strength and confidence we can place in recommendations made by physicians or professional organizations like the AAP guidelines, American Academy of pa Pediatric Guidelines. And then because it is in the news, I'd like to talk about the treatments 
really the foundational role of healthy diet and physical activity, but then also talk about these new medications that are gaining so much uh, press coverage and uh, publicity. So uh, from where you're sitting, I hope everyone can see it, but it just illustrates the trends in obesity among children uh, over the past few decades. And in the y-axis here is, I don't know if you can see that, can't really, but in the y-axis uh, is the percent or prevalence of the condition, and years is along the bottom. And the different colors represent different uh, fragments or sections of the childhood population. And the black line is everybody. And as you can see, starting in about 1980, the prevalence of obesity sharply increased to reach about almost 20%, and that's where we stand today. And it's higher in adolescents, but even toddlers have not been immune to this change in obesity risk. Now, uh, while all children can be affected by obesity, as we were saying before, regardless of their income or race or ethnicity, uh, this table, and it's kind of busy, uh, shows that the effects are differential depending on socioeconomic group. And up in the top of the, the top section of this table, I'll just draw your attention to uh, the totals, including both females and males and that the prevalence of obesity is about 17% among all childhood groups. But it's quite different if we start looking at different uh, race and ethnic categories. And uh, highest in the black and Hispanic populations, uh, uh, next comes the uh, white population, and lowest in the Asian population. And it's quite a marked difference. There are also some subtle differences between females and males, uh, but not as marked as between race and eth ethnic category. Also, the risk is increased for children in low-income households. And so uh, the, row, the row headings here refer to percent uh, relative to the federal poverty level. And the federal poverty level is $30,000 for a family of four. So it's an extremely low income um, for a family of four. And in the uh, two lower categories, that's below 130% of the poverty level and 130 to 350% of the pov poverty level, we see very close to 20% uh, obesity prevalence in children from uh, households of those income levels. And a much lower prevalence of only about 11% above 350% of the federal poverty level. So, you know, at 350%, we'd be, um, in the range of uh, you know, 90 to $115,000 a year. Um, but anywhere below that, you can see that obesity is much more common and it, it nearly doubles the risk. So food insecurity uh, is believed to be a risk factor for obesity. And what is food insecurity? Well, food insecurity is defined by the USDA as limited or uncertain access to food, and primarily due to uh, financial considerations. Um, it's been found that uh, children who are in families where food is insecure have an increased risk for obesity. Um, how do we ascertain that? Um, it can be tricky because you don't want to stigmatize families by asking these questions verbally, so most commonly, uh, clinics such as ours uh, present families with a questionnaire that they can answer sort of uh, in confidence, and it, those data can be reviewed um, uh, outside, of the, outside of the exam room, but still in a fashion where we are aware of this issue and can offer resources to uh, help uh, support families. Um, but the questions that the families respond to sort of illustrate um, you know, what it means on the ground, if you will. So the first one being we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. And number two, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. And uh, these two questions, if a family answers affirmatively to at least one of them, it has, it has a very high sensitivity, meaning we capture a lot of families who are actually food insecure. So it's a quick method to uh, ascertain this issue. Identification of food insecurity 
uh, can lead to some interventions, like a referral to our social worker, and uh, they can connect families with things like in Cleveland, we have farmer's markets where you can use a SNAP card and um, they can access fresh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and whole foods. There are also food pantries in the city that can also be, uh, you know, can inform families about them. Another concept uh, worthy of discussion are food deserts and food swamps. Food deserts are defined as geographic areas where a family lives more than a mile from a full service grocery store. So grocery having whole foods, different food departments, uh, fresh meats, fresh vegetables, and fruits, as well as canned goods. Um, this chart shows uh, the location and um, sort of severity of the food deserts in the country. It focuses on low-income households, and the color bar refers to the percentage, percentage of uh, low-income households that are in a food desert. And just from this map of the country, you can see that a lot of food deserts are kind of in rural areas, uh, really all over the country, um, and also sort of a predominance in the south. If you were to superimpose a map showing childhood obesity prevalence or diabetes prevalence uh, on top of this map, they would closely align. So th there is a connection between food deserts and uh, obesity and diabetes. Food swamps, and those are not illustrated in this map, refers to food deserts where uh, rather than grocery stores, uh, there are stores that sell food that is unhealthy. So it might be fast food restaurants or convenience stores. And some families are forced to turn to those types of uh, food outlets for their nourishment. Another culprit we like to uh, always ascertain and address is the consumption of sugar in drinks. And uh, this link between childhood sugary drink consumption and obesity is well known, and we know that trials that specifically seek to lower consumption of sugary drinks are effective in helping either turn around or prevent the worsening of obesity. Uh, this figure shows the number of calories along the y-axis uh, obtained from sugary drink consumption over the years along the bottom. And the good news is that public health messaging and in some uh, situations taxation and limiting access to these drinks has effectively lowered the consumption of uh, sugary drinks and calories from them. Uh, uh, the colors within the bars refers to the specific beverage type. So the uh, black color referring to soda and the lighter colored bar referring to fruit drinks. And you can see for most categories, this has declined over the years, but especially for soda. Um, you know, recent data shows that for adolescents, however, they're still getting about 150 to 200 calories a day uh, from sugary drinks. And, you know, on a daily basis, it doesn't sound like much, but if you figure that they do that every day, week after week and year after year, then um, you can really see how serious a contributor uh, this category of drinks could be for childhood obesity. So still an area of concern and something that we always uh, try to ascertain and also uh, a source where in the primary care setting, we encourage families not to introduce these drinks. Uh, still another a uh, concept that has emerged in the last maybe 10 years has been this of ultra-processed foods. And ultra-processed foods were defined by a researcher in Spain, and he created these categories, uh, a hierarchy, if you will, of food processing. And <clears throat> uh, the culprit food category is ultra-processed foods, and these are foods that um, add things uh, to improve the cosmetic appearance of foods or the texture of foods or the shelf life of foods. And he and other groups have found a high association between consumption of these foods and childhood obesity. Uh, it's harder to say um, so far that specifically trying to uh, decrease in consumption of these foods will lower obesity, uh, but there is a strong association. So 
you know, f for the kids that we see in our office, we do ask about uh, not only, um, you know, the calories and the sugary intake, uh, sugary drink intake, uh, that's typical, but also the use of processed foods and restaurant foods. Uh, a lot of the kids, uh, you know, if they come home and there's not a parent or guardian uh, and they're hungry, we'll have things like ramen noodles or they might have uh, Lunchables packed in their lunch box. And a lot of these foods are very high in calories and low in uh, nutrition. So to take a step back and say, well, what is obesity? Obesity historically is referred to a high proportion of your body being made up by fat, uh, uh, by fat tissue. And the uh, typical percentage is 30% more body fat is defined as obesity. But that's difficult to ascertain and, and detect because uh, you know, that would typically need some special imaging or um, you know, other special tests that can't be done quickly in an office setting. So uh, we have found that something, this concept called body mass index, which, which takes into account one's weight and also one's height, is a surrogate for body fat. And it works pretty good most of the time, except in situations where somebody is very muscular or may have, um, you know, in particular, low muscle mass. Uh, for us, obesity is de defined as when a child's BMI exceeds the 95th percentile. And that's because in children, um, uh, BMI is an absolute number, starts a little high, goes down, and then goes up. But if you use a percentile, then that controls for the natural change in BMI throughout childhood development. So uh, what are some of the medical complications of childhood obesity? It can really affect every body system. So it has a huge impact on children's health and adult health. Uh, you know, thinking about the brain and development, children with obesity have higher rates of depression and anxiety. Uh, it can cause very low exercise tolerance and exacerbate asthma. From the cardiovascular standpoint, it's associated with high cholesterol, high blood pressure. All of these increase the risk of uh, heart disease and stroke. It can cause liver disease. Uh, in my field, we worry especially about type 2 diabetes. And a lot of children have a lot of muscular and skeletal pain because of, simply because of the weight they have to carry. And that can greatly limit their ability to participate in physical activity or even uh, their normal daily activities. We think obesity causes a lot of these problems because it directly leads to high blood pressure. High insulin can lead to high blood pressure, high insulin, and the failure of insulin to work efficiently can lead to diabetes. And then the uh, dynamics of uh, having a lot of uh, fat cells in your body can lead to disordered lipids or high cholesterol. Uh, these um, sort of proximal defects can then lead to other organ injury, such as kidney failure and vision loss from diabetes. Uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol can lead to heart disease, which is still the, the leading killer in this nation, and stroke. And then diabetes and, and high body weight can also lead to liver disease, which sometimes can lead to liver failure. There is a huge financial cost of obesity in general, but also for childhood obesity. Studies indicate that for a child with obesity at age 10, there's an added $20,000 um, of cost over the lifetime of that child. And if you multiply that by all the children who are age 10 who have obesity, that adds up to $14 billion in added lifetime costs associated with childhood obesity. Uh, another model determined that for a child with obesity, it adds between $100 and $300 per year of uh, medical expenses for that child starting in childhood. Uh, and, th and these only refer to direct costs meaning costs related to evaluation in a medical office, medications, treatment, um, and does not capture the full, implica full implications of things like missed school or missed work for a parent. So we always focus on prevention in our field. 
And um, primary prevention means preventing obesity from occurring in the first place. And that starts sort of prenatally by uh, promoting conditions to um, uh, achieve healthy amounts of weight gain in expectant mothers. Uh, for primary care providers talking about and encouraging breastfeeding, to, talk, to, re to giving concrete recommendations for diet goals in children, limiting sugary drinks, encouraging the consumption of fruits and vegetables, limiting screen time, trying to achieve an hour per day of physical activity starting at age five, and encouraging regular sleep and wake times as that can have an effect on appetite and uh, stress and uh, response to hunger signals. Uh, so a lot of things that just occur naturally in children who aren't in online school and who have a safe environment, uh, you know, we're trying to make more concrete and deliver that message to everybody. Secondary prevention is more uh, what we do in our clinic. So children who already have obesity and we want to either prevent future complications um, or to reverse, reverse their obes obesity or at least slow the worsening of it. So that gets into management and I, I did want to spend a little time talking about stigma. Stigma is a major factor and major barrier and challenge in the treatment of childhood obesity. It refers to beliefs or bias based on weight, which can result in actions taken against the target of the bias, uh, or basically discrimination. So there are a lot of myths surrounding obesity. Uh, first, obesity is a failure of self-control. There are some people even in medicine who don't regard obesity as a disease. But in reality, uh, people with similar levels of self-control, one child will become obese and many others will not. Uh, so obesity is due to many factors outside of one's uh, so-called self-control. There is the thought or, or school of thought that blaming an individual or, or believing that you're holding a child accountable for their obesity will motivate them to change. In fact, it can have the opposite effect. Um, it may cause a person to withdraw and actually not seek out treatment or be afraid of trying to make change. And then, as I said, obesity uh, is a medical term. Well, in our field, we regard obesity as a medical term and a clinical diagnosis. Um, but surveys of families and children who come to our center have found that there are a lot of words that they don't want to hear in clinic, that if they hear them, they're kind of triggering. And for some, even the clinical diagnosis of obesity uh, makes them uh, sort of feel judged and um, stigmatized. So, you know, we do some things in our field to work around that, like refer to high BMI or high body weight uh, rather than uh, obesity. Um, there are, as you may gather, consequences of obesity that sort of further the cycle. So if you look at the right side of this diagram, um, starting from the center, the term obesity, that can lead to, as we talked about, stigma, teasing, bullying, and blaming. Children can internalize that, and some of them cope with those sorts of feelings by uh, manifesting disordered eating, uh, binging and purging, becoming distressed, uh, and withdrawn. Uh, we've had, we have a lot of children in our center who start to be homeschooled because of teasing that occurs uh, when they go to school. And uh, when they stay home all day, they may be on online school. They lack the structure of having times for their meals. They don't have gym class. They may not even get the activity involved in walking to the school bus or walking around the school. Uh, COVID sort of amplifies the, the, the need for structure and even regular movement uh, because the findings are that COVID really accelerated and worsened the prevalence of obesity in children. Obesity also, as we mentioned before, can cause physical pain and deconditioning, and that can lead to very low exercise tolerance. Um, some of our kids have, have requested things like a note excusing them from gym class because it's hard for them and that will just make things worse. So we try to meet them where they are, start with very um, 
basic and seemingly um, simple requests for physical activity, like um, in some cases things like checking the mail, or walking up and down the stairs, or helping with household chores. Um, you know, alluding to other causes of, ob of obesity, you know, there are some genetic conditions we think about that can cause obesity too. Uh, the most common one is something called Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, it's not that uncommon in our field, um, but you may not know it seeing an affected person. These are children who are born and, and they have very low muscle tone, they're kind of uh, floppy. Uh, they may, as a result, feed rather poorly and gain weight poorly early in life, but then later on there's like a switch that goes off and then they have an insatiable appetite and are classically described as kids who will like break into the refrigerator or pantry in the middle of the night uh, or try to leave the home and, and go to the convenience store to buy food. And there's some other physical features that we look for in genetic tests that we can do uh, to identify this condition and their treatment. Uh, overlaps a lot with sort of typical childhood obesity, but there are some unique aspects to it as well. I'll skip that. So when we think about medical evidence, and I think as journalists, um, it's good to be uh, mindful of, of the strength of evidence uh, when a new news report or a new uh, research report comes out. Uh, we regard uh, evidence of, as being organized into a hierarchy where case, dis case studies or one doctor or practices experience with a few patients is sort of the weakest level of evidence. The evidence is stronger if you're studying a larger group, like 100 or 50,000 patients. Um, that sort of study, where you link certain characteristics of that population and a disease condition, can help you identify new risk factors or complications related to that disease. And some people regard the clinical trial as the strongest form of uh, medical research. This is a a study where you can control as many variables as you want, like we're going to pick uh, patients of a certain age group with a very specific variety of condition, uh, give them an exact dose of a medication, and see what happens to them. And <clears throat> that sort of idealized study is what the FDA uses to um, give approval for medications. But it's not a, it's not a study design that we can use uh, to identify um, uh, you know, tr trends in a, in a population, for example. Those still require cohort studies. And when a physician or a professional body makes uh, recommendations, too, it can be based on varying levels of evidence. And the weakest recommendations our field makes uh, is based on things like case studies or expert opinion. And you, you feel a little bit more strongly about and are a little more confident about recommendations if they're based on uh, cohort studies of large groups and, uh, or, or clinical trials that you know, may be smaller or occasionally consistent results. And we give the strongest recommendations if they are high quality, large clinical trials. Uh, we use techniques to overcome stigma. As I mentioned before, we're very sensitive about language. In our field, we think if someone walks in the door that they may be interested in talking about obesity, but sometimes the child or adolescent is not. So we often ask for permission to address their weight. And sometimes that can open a, a little window where you can have a conversation. We really focus on developing habits more than achieving a certain amount of weight loss because weight loss is hard. And if we focus on things like um, knowledge and building and sustaining healthy habits, then that's a win. Uh, so we need different metrics for success in our field, like things like, how do you feel? Are you functioning better? Are you less short of breath walking up and down the stairs at school? You know, lab tests can improve, even a lot without a lot or any weight loss, because body composition may change. Uh, but still, at the end of the day, some teens especially come to us and they say, I want to weigh less so I can uh, you know, wear more in different kinds of clothes. And for them, you know, we have to, to meet them where they are. So there are tons of studies, like on low glycemic load, 
mural placements, which are like some fast um, protein shakes, uh, the use of prebiotics, low carb diet, that's the Atkins diet. These and many other uh, diets have been studied in clinical trials for children and adolescents. And largely, they're all uh, effective and safe. Uh, but the benefits tend to be pretty small. And um, time-limited eating, that is uh, intermittent fasting, another way to describe intermittent fasting. Uh, but the fact is not, there's not a single diet that is more effective than others. Um, and if the diet is too structured, they're hard to sustain. We do know that adding exercise to a healthy diet is more effective than a diet alone or exercise alone. Uh, we do know that things like reducing sugary drinks and lowering screen time are uh, worthy objectives and effective. Getting back to the guidelines that came out in January 2023, uh, these really continue to stress um, lifestyle changes, diet and exercise, but the new elements were management in the medical home, and that means primary care, and that means not what I do, which is kind of specialty care. Um, there was a focus on equity, things like food deserts and food insecurity, uh, access to safe play areas. It focused on a team approach, so not necessarily a medical person, but maybe a dietitian or a wellness coach or a lay person who's informed and a very effective teacher. And then it, there uh, was greater emphasis on medications and surgery too, which really uh, became the focus for a lot of uh, press coverage. In terms of medications for obesity, up until about um, six years ago, there was one, maybe two medicines approved for the child and adolescent age group. One of them, Orlistat, is available over the counter right now and has been for a couple of decades. It's called Ali over the counter or Xenocal at, by, at prescription strength and isn't very effective and can cause uh, uh, kind of a greasy diarrhea because it blocks your body from absorbing fat. So it's been out there but doesn't work that well on pleasant side effects. Uh, really of late, Wegovi, which um, another name for it is Ozempic, and that's really been the target of a lot of uh, press coverage and um, interest in social media. Uh, this is an injected medicine, the newest form you inject once a week under the skin. It acts by lowering appetite in the brain and causing your stomach to uh, empty more slowly, so kind of increasing the sense of fullness. And there was a weaker form of it approved about eight years ago, but um, whereas that one promoted about 6% weight loss, Wegovi promotes about 14% weight loss, and that's on average. So in our field, that's like a major breakthrough because a lot of meds have been sort of in this three to six to 8% weight reduction, and to have one that reduces weight by 14% uh, is pretty remarkable, actually. Uh, there are also some other pills. Qsimia is a pill that was approved uh, also this year, or actually late last year, for children age 12 and up. It combines a medicine called Phentermine and Topiramate, and those were already uh, existing and known medications, and in combination, uh, boost weight loss further. Uh, this is an example of the injection device that um, the patients use. And then in terms of weight loss surgery, right now uh, there are two main forms of surgery, gastric bypass and what's called a sleeve gastrectomy. And really the um, sleeve gastrectomy has become the most commonly used uh, form of weight loss surgery for all populations, but especially for adolescents. And still used very infrequently, about 1% um, you know, much less than 1% of patients get surgery. About 1% would probably qualify for surgery based on these criteria. And that's having a sufficiently high BMI, um, generally um, having a serious comorbidity, something like diabetes or liver disease related to obesity uh, are also considerations. 
And then they also have to be mostly through puberty. So it's not for young children or early puberty, early pubertal kids. They have to be cognizant uh, of the potential side effects. Uh, I emphasize your relationship with food will change forever. They have to have a supportive family that will keep them on track because um, they have to eat very different, differently and forever, and they have to take supplements. So it's really a select population, a combination of high BMI, comorbidities, and the right individual and uh, family support. It is very effective though, equally effective in adolescents as it is in adults. This is weight change on the y-axis and years along the bottom. And the adolescents are in blue, the adults in yellow, and they have very similar amounts of weight loss. And um, right now the data for adolescents, we have nine and 10 year data. But like I said, we don't know what happens in 20 years or 30 years or 50 years. So uh, we have to think about cost too. You know, Wegovi is a weekly shot. It costs $1,600 a month if one were pay out of pocket. Uh, bariatric surgery is a one-time thing and, and would cost about $30,000, you know, for the procedure and perioperative care. So clearly these are not the answer to solving this uh, crisis of childhood obesity. Um, obesity we, is a chronic disease. If someone goes on these medicines, as soon as they stop them, the data show that the weight will come right back on. So, um, you know, we have to think hard about whether or not um, uh, these medicines are gonna be really useful prescribed widely. Still, we have to consider that for some severely affected adolescents, uh, it could be worth it. You know, if they have a high burden of other medical issues, a lot of depression or um, psychosocial impact from their illness, that uh, this could be, uh, these could be life-saving. So uh, just to wrap up now, uh, we highlighted that how common obesity is, how impactful it is on individual health and psychosocial health, that treatment focus will remain lifestyle changes. And we need to emphasize dispelling myths and getting true, uh, truthful information out there and countering uh, misinformation. Um, there are a lot of societal and economic factors that we have to consider uh, when we talk about treatment and the causes of obesity. And, you know, lastly, that medical systems aren't the answer to this. Um, <clears throat> we're often sought out to comment on stories but really it's a societal, cultural, and uh, uh, it's wrapped up in a lot of socioeconomic factors as well. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll have some good discussion, I hope. Is the sort of takeaway message that we get from this information is that there is a cohort of children for whom all the innovations and all of the research or whatever simply won't Act, they won't be able to access it. And that's the real cost of childhood obesity. Because obviously parents who have wealth and access can do this. But that's really what we're talking about, right? I sh there's a slide early on showing the um, vast difference in obesity frequency from low income households compared to higher income households. And you know, what feeds into that? Well, it's access to healthy foods, it's having the resources and time to prepare those foods. Um, you know, it's about the, the built environment too for those families and their access to sports and athletic um, uh, opportunities. Um, and that sort of difference permeates the rest of, um, you know, the public health and medical system too in terms of um, health insurance. In Ohio, our Medicaid, which covers children from the lowest income groups, right now excludes coverage for obesity-related medications. And that's something that you know, is a true disparity, and people are working on, and our gov government relations department, too, is trying to advocate uh, in regard to Medicaid patients. But it's something that doesn't emerge in just the AAP guidelines, for example. Um, and you know, I also, uh, would say that there's a huge uninsured population. So people 
who don't have any kind of coverage at all. And they're almost worse off in terms of accessing the healthcare system and getting any kind of medication. And I, you know, I think it just goes back to illustrate that this isn't um, a medical problem so much as a public health crisis. Thank you, Dr. Kim. My name is uh, Rachel Cohen. I write for Vox. I live in DC. Um, I think something that a lot of journalists are trying to reconcile as we follow this conversation is uh, these, you know, interventions and especially the medications are coming at, at the same time culturally as there's been this, you know, big push to try to, you know, destigmatize uh, fat bodies, uh, de-link health and weight, sort of critical examinations of the BMI as a metric, and I think it's there's also been, frankly, a lot of uh, critique of the sort of science and medical community for fat bias for patients when they come in, like you come in for a hurt knee and they say, well, have you considered losing weight? And, you know, making comments that are not about weight and then the patients don't want to come back for other regular maintenance or routine health care. Um, and so I guess I'm curious, like, in, in your community and, and in your conversations, like, how much is tackling fat bias in the medical community come up? Because I feel like you talked a lot about stigma and the sort of stigma that the general public has of obese uh, individuals. But I think there's also this concurrent, like, real distrust of medical providers for what people are sort of raising awareness about fat bias from uh, medical community. And I think it's making, um, it, it's causing a lot of distrust also on the like we go via Ozempic drugs because people are like distrustful that the people recommending them are doing it from a place that is not with bad bias. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And um, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, important issues that you raise. You know, the teenagers that we see, they come in, they're on their phones from the minute they walk in. And you know, when we look at their screen time use, sometimes it's like 10 or 12 hours a day. And I know, and I'm not of this era to know what's on TikTok or Instagram, but I know they, um, you know, there, there's so much more, uh, there's so many more images they're exposed to about ideal body image. Um, and I think it exerts enormous uh, pressure on them. Um, and so I think body shaming and stigma, uh, those are real things. I think the medical system is terrible about it, frankly, that um, you know, even in our hospital system, you know, the recommendation is uh, your blood pressure is high, lose 10 pounds, you know, come back in six months. Um, and you know, if, if it were that easy, this wouldn't be a health problem at all. Um, so I think, and, and even in our clinic, where we try to be very sensitive to avoiding uh, triggering words, asking permission to even broach these subjects, we get responses that families don't want to come back because they, they felt you know, blamed and scrutinized. And we're like, I think, trying to even have a heightened sensitivity to it. So I think definitely we need to, in our field, be made more aware of how to open up these conversations uh, in a sensitive way um, and also, I think it, it illustrates really the heightened sensitivity. Uh, you know, a lot of these teens, their whole life, or adults too, their whole life, they've been just getting this negative messaging, and it's hard to undo that. Um, I'm Mary Flum with NBC News. Uh, I'm based in New York, but I'm a, a national uh, journalist and field producer. Um, I, Thank you very much for your time today, um, both as a journalist and I'm also a mom of four school-aged kids, so I've seen firsthand and, um, as, as a parent and, and covering the stories, it's, it's obviously a big concern. Uh, two quick questions. One, you mentioned, I did have a question about insurance with respect to these weight loss drugs. You mentioned in Ohio, for example, it's not covered. Does that vary state to state? Yeah, every state's different. Every state's different. Um, and our insurance com is it going to be insurance company to insurance company as well? Right. I, so I would say, yeah. So in Ohio, you know, about 30% of our patients are on Medicaid. So these are children from households with the lowest uh, levels of income, you know, uh, 
below 130% of the poverty line. Uh, and that's a very low level of income. So there's you know, a huge population who are just above that threshold who may not qualify for Medicaid, um, but they may not be able to afford a private plan, either work for a company where health benefits are, are you know, part of the package or pay out of pocket for um, you know, a, a Obamacare type plan. I mean, those are not cheap. So that's a huge segment of the population. A lot of the times we just don't see those kids because they are not coming in the door, but they're out there and they're suffering from the same health consequences as anyone else. Uh, private plans can differ in their levels of coverage, but more often will cover these medications. Thank you for that. And then my second question has to do with uh, what you noted about the ultra processed foods. And also I thought it was really interesting what you also had noted in, in your conversation about what would seem, and, and the stories I've covered as well, I mean, we, we've been covering, especially during the pandemic, I mean, childcare has been a huge issue. Where it's grown in terms of the issue. So a lot of kids are being left home alone and the easiest solution are these ultra processed foods. Um, even the best parent, you know, that's separate from the food desert. I, I don't know that we're, you know, it's being covered as much, but it's just easy. And, and the child is often home alone or with other maybe teenagers in the same boat. Legislatively, do you see something moving in the direction? I mean, Europe certainly doesn't have as many ultra processed <coughs> foods, and we have seen the needle move a little bit with the removal of some ingredients following the EU model. Do you see us moving in that direction as these numbers tick up? And, and I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are legislatively, what may be in the works that maybe we're unaware of, at least at state levels. I mean, do you see it legislatively as, as a country weeding out some of these ultra processed foods and moving towards maybe a little more of the EU model, which limits some of these ingredients? Um, like you said, you, you know, you understand the appeal of these foods if, if parents or guardians are working and um, kids are hungry, uh, there's not much time and their, their price is right. Why these uh, sort of easy to heat and eat foods or e easy uh, prep foods are so popular. You know, there's some precedent, I think, for uh, government intervention like the, the um, trans fats, for example, were banned from foods. And now you can't, trans fats you know, used to be in everything because they helped uh, improve the, um, you know, the texture of foods and, and the mouthfeel of foods, but were uh, notorious for causing heart disease. And those have been banned. And in some um, cities, uh, sugary beverages were taxed, and that is actually an effective approach uh, to lower consumption. And that, you know, that worked for cigarettes too. Um, I think it's a harder ask to, to ban a category of food, and even in you know, the scientific and medical community, we recognize that not all ultra-processed foods are the same. Some are actually probably pretty good, if you think about things like maybe th there's like a, a protein bar or nut-based item that would qualify as ultra-processed, but still be relatively good for you, having high protein and healthy fats, for example. So um, to me, it would be hard to envision you know, how you go about banning a category of foods like ultra processed when there, there is still, and I didn't really talk about it, the, the, uh, you know, it's not monolithic in that sense. There's some good, good ones in there and some bad ones. And, pro and even within Lunchables, there's, you know, some, some good ones and uh, some really bad ones too. I want to piggyback on that really quickly because I believe there's a councilman here in Cleveland who also introduced legislation to limit the number of dollar store, sort of quick convenience stores in various communities. So I wanted to get more of your insight into whether we've moved to a place where legislation is the only way we're gonna do this. I, I, I'm, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, is that you know, gonna happen? I, I have, you know, I'm a physician, so I try to stay in, in my lane, but when I think about uh, legislation, you know, thinking about the after effects and who it really impacts. You know, if you limit dollar stores, what neighborhoods and what populations are most affected by that, and then what is going to come into its place to provide a, a better alternative. Uh, and, and I think about that, you know, for these sin taxes on, on things like sugar, um, but also, you know, if we control what type of store gets built where, it's probably not going to affect the wealthy suburbanite at all. Um, and that is also a, a disparity. 
Uh, Bonnie Petrie, Texas Public Radio. A um, couple of things. One starting with the processed food or uh, food quality in general. Um, when you talk about low socioeconomic status, I think about um, food quality and um, its contribution to gut health. I know that that's an area that almost all aspects of medic medicine are exploring. Um, is that true uh, for obesity doctors as well? Um, and uh, what impact does food, could food quality have on that, as well as uh, sort of shifting to a different uh, aspect of that um, chronic stress and childhood adversity? Oh, how do they contribute to childhood obesity when you think about lower socioeconomic status? Um, the second part of your question, we have as part of our team a psychologist and she always screens for adverse childhood events, you know, childhood traumas. Um, these can range from abuse or witnessed abuse or being in foster care, you know, unimaginable things happening. Um, I think right now there aren't a whole lot of data about the connection between those early childhood events and childhood obesity. But we need to recognize them in our practice because in an unstable social situation, uh, where mental health needs are not being met, it's really difficult even to open a conversation about you know, changing what you're eating and drinking and, and increasing exercise because sort of the fundamentals of uh, making those changes is having a stable social environment. And if that's not present, we sort of recognize that uh, as a reality and almost you know, try to connect them with, with resources to stabilize those things, and then hopefully later on uh, they can come back and we can talk about nutrition and exercise. Um, related to the issue of gut health, I, I had one slide and just snap right through it, but it was a trial of prebiotics. And um, more and more we we're realizing that, you know, our, our gut is colonized by millions of, of bacteria. The types of bacteria in there seem to modulate our risk for various uh, medical conditions, and that includes obesity and diabetes, inflammatory conditions, and autoimmune conditions. Um, and uh, there is this association between what you eat and sort of what colonizes your gut. Um, the frequency that one took antibiotics in childhood may alter the, that. Uh, microbial population and then also change your downstream and future risk for disease. Uh, so we do ask about uh, diet quality and use of ultra processed foods. We don't call them that, but we know, you know, we have a very high proportion of kids who really rely on that um, uh, for their nutrition. Um, a lot of families take probiotics, you know, with the belief that that's going to alter their flora. But what's been found is that it's really prebiotic. So it's like, it's not the probiotics are like the bacteria themselves. And if you ingest enough, you know, it might shift things a little bit, but it's very transient. But prebiotics are like food categories, like things with a lot of indigestible fibers. So that would include things like legumes and cabbage and onions and broccoli. And those are not digested early in our gut, but later on the bacteria that can digest them uh, start to um, become predominant. And those are kind of the fa favorable bacteria that can help lower things like inflammation and risk for diabetes. So we don't actually promote prebiotic use like that trial did. That was a, a powder of prebiotics that people would take two tablespoons of every day. And that actually had a beneficial effect. We try to do it with just natural foods and increasing, you know, kind of lowering the processed foods, introducing more um, prebiotic category foods, which basically is whole foods with a lot of fiber. Uh, my name's Eli, I am a freelancer. Um, my questions, I have two, you can pick and choose, answer, neither, answer, both, whatever you want to do. Um, both related to corners of slides. Um, on one corner of the bariatric slide, you said that supportive family is a criterion for that. Can you discuss more whether that's, you have some objective way of measuring that? Is that a criterion in every center that's doing bariatrics? Is there a standardized way of assessing that across country, or is that like due to these psychosocial assessments at each center. Um, the second question I want to ask is about um, changes in puberty. You mentioned precocious puberty as well as hypogonadism, depending on the, the 
gender assigned at birth of the individual. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about those because I know we've seen recent changes in the trends of um, onset of people. Yeah, uh, good and interesting questions uh, in regard to uh, uh, establishing that an uh, adolescent patient has a supportive family uh, before moving forward with bariatric surgery that is part of uh, national guidelines uh, to um, to undertake safe bariatric surgery. Um, so, you know, uh, surgery is recommended to occur in bariatric centers. So a center with a certain amount of experience, the appropriate surrounding team of dietitians and social work. Uh, for the individual patient, <coughs> uh, there's no um, sort of questionnaire or scoring system to rate uh, what is a supportive family. But we know that it's important to have appropriate parental supervision. And um, that's because uh, the adolescent needs to take a bunch of supplements every day to replace the vitamins that they may not be absorbing or getting from their limited diet. They need to be able to uh, be brought to their clinic visits on a regular intervals to monitor for any complications. Uh, they need to also be coached even before consideration for surgery. They have to be engaged with the medical management program so that they understand the basics and have realistic expectations of what surgery can achieve. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, I think a combination of uh, an informed adolescent with realistic expectations and um, a family that is willing to, you know, commit all the time. And it's numerous hours and a lot of travel that they have to do, uh, a lot of missed work as well. So it, it just seems to me that those are family structures that may um, exclude certain communities, for example, single parents, parents working two jobs, uh, uh, families for whom English is a second language, families for whom health literacy is historically uh, less high. So I wonder if you, how you approach those situations. Well, I mean, um, we have a lot of families, uh, you know, not with two parents, with single parents, um, and patients with Medicaid uh, who qualify for bariatric surgery and are able to have it done. Uh, we have social work support to arrange rides uh, as well. But um, I don't think that's been well examined. You know, the, uh, if there are inequities in access to bariatric surgery, I think that's an important question that I don't think has been reported on. Um, in our clinic, it's really a, a s s very small number who have surgery. I mean, we see, you know, in the hundreds of patients per year, uh, and we probably send less than 10 for bariatric surgery every year. So ours is a small sample size. I think we have a mix of patients. Um, but you know, all those dimensions are important considerations, for sure. We are nearing the end of our time okay. with you, so I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask the last question. Obviously, evidence is a huge part of research and medical research, and so I'm recalling a story I read about a mother and her six-year-old child who, whenever she wanted to go to the farmer's market, had to take three buses and you know, just go through just this incredible goal. Is there enough evidence that low-income people in vulnerable neighborhoods would access healthier food if it was made easier for them? And is that another direction that needs to be considered? Um, I think provision of food does work and, and does have an effect, but it's a real challenge to make that happen because we could I mean, we have maps of where the farmer markets are, farmers markets are, but in Cleveland, the public transportation isn't very good. So it's important to kind of find sources close to where somebody lives, and that's not always feasible. Uh, I'd also say that plenty of times families say, yeah, you know, we came last time and we filled our fridge with a bunch of fruits and vegetables um, and nobody ate them or I didn't know what to do with them. So I, th I think there's also, you know, we encounter a lot of kids who are extremely um, food fussy. So even if you give them, hand them the right kinds of foods, they're not gonna eat it because they find the texture or taste, um, you know, unappealing. And that goes back to like early childhood feeding practices and what the family does. Um, and uh, I also think a lot of times uh, parents, just never learned those skills. And I think that's a huge issue too. So 
uh, we also try to um, increase skills, uh, culinary skills. It sounds like education and access then are two huge parts Absolutely. of this issue. And so we are, are fortunate to be, now have a connection to you so that as these journalists uh, consider doing these stories, hopefully they'll be able to reach out to you and, By all means, and get that support. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Kim for joining us today. Thank you.